Hi, I got I got questions about the uh, doctrines and covenants. Oh, hey, Gail, how are you? I'm doing excellent. <laughs> Good. Um, how so? How are you been doing on your studies and everything? I've been doing uh, excellent. Good. Were you able to get in contact with the missionaries near you? Um, I managed to um, talk to um, some Mormons, um, but um, uh, not near where I live. Um, so, um, because I think we found out what, um, what mission is in your um, area, and so we will be able to email you the contact information for the Mormon missionaries near you, so they can, like, Come do Bible studies with you and help you out with your questions. Oh, so you'll be able to give me their, uh, like, uh, number? Like their contact information, we would love. We are not in a Wi-Fi area, so our email's not working right now. But tomorrow we can definitely, or at least, I can promise you by Sunday that we can have um, their information sent out to you. So you can contact, like, a missionary to you. Do um, you like that? Uh, I'd be able to um, ask some questions about the Book of Mormon and doctrines and yep. covenants, but um, what really, what really, really um, uh, bothered me is when when I was reading um, doctrines and covenants section uh, forty two verse eighty one. Forty two verse what? Eighty one. That's awesome that you've been studying all these books. Sorry? It's great that you've been studying it. It's really important for us to study. <clears throat> Alright, yeah, we're looking at the verse right now. Yeah, it, it talks about, but he or she shall be condemned by the mouth of two witnesses. But um, that don't line up with what Jesus says in the Bible, the King James Bible, about uh, condemn not um, in Luke chapter 6. Um, I'll just grab that scripture because I've been um, thinking, well, um, Jesus cannot lie um, about what he says and he specifically gave us instructions not to condemn anyone um, in um, let's have a look Luke chapter 6 verse 37 says judge not and ye shall not be judged condemn not and ye shall not be condemned forgive and ye shall be forgiven so Luke chapter 6 uh, verse uh, 37 does not agree with doctrines and covenants section uh, 42 verse 81 why because Jesus specifically says condemn not and he's, he's specifically even telling the Mormons to condemn not and um, in doctrines and covenants section uh, 42 verse 81 talks about uh, but he or she shall be condemned by the mouth of two witnesses and the elders shall lay the case before the church and the church shall lift up their hands against him or her that they may be doubts with according to the law of God, the Mormon God. Now, it, it goes on to talk about lift up their hands against him or her. Now, that, that in itself suggests that there's abuse, like physical assault. So how do you go about that one? Yeah, so, yeah, so the verse on you're looking at on DNC 4281, um, the verse before it helps you. It says, if any man or woman commit adultery, he or she shall be tried before two elders of the church. So verse 81 is continuing verse 80, which is just reminding us that we shouldn't commit adultery. That, that how is that in the, one of the commandments that we are asked to follow to keep ourselves and our body and mind and everything just kind of clean and pure so that we will know the importance it is 
to have families and to respect that that what God has given us as a privilege. But would you would you condemn someone who is caught in adultery? Well, my favorite story is about the woman that was caught in adultery, and that when the judges they took him her to Christ, and how Christ he took a moment and he drew in the sand, and he looked up and he said. Who, thou who, set, who has been, throw the first stone. He who among you first cast the first stone. There we go. That is one of my favorite stories about the Bible, and I think that shows us that we should not judge others, that we should not condemn each other, but to forgive and to love, no matter how hard it may be, because that's what our Savior did for us. He died for us so we could be forgiven. Um, with... Um, the thing is, in, in Doctrines and Covenants section 42, verse 81, uh, it, it it suggests that they are to, to condemn the person who is caught in adultery. Um, so, um, what do you think about that one? How it says that he or she shall be condemned by the mouth of two witnesses. Is that where you're asking in verse 81? Yeah. So when it talks about the witnesses in verse 80, it takes you over there and it has witnesses, has that little asterisk back by it. It kind of talks about the witnesses can sometimes be taken as like a confession or it can be evident or how it can be um, revelation that as people, sometimes when we make mistakes, we do know we make mistakes. And if you kind of take it as a way as we are working on to be forgiven, to tell my father we're willing to fix those mistakes that we don't want to be condemned for the mistakes that we've made, but be able to be forgiven and work down that repentance process that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ laid for us. In um, John chapter 8 verse 7 says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. But in DNC, it specifically states in 42 verse 81, uh, it talks about, but he or she shall be condemned. So it's more or less a um, the word condem condemned means to um, make them feel bad, feel guilty, um, make them um, like um, like with America where they they have the death penalty. That's condemnation upon murderers. And so when I look at um, doctrines and covenants section forty two verse eighty one, I see that. Um, uh, Mormons condemn people, condemned it, um, and and then it talks about how they lift up their hands against him or her. So what's that suggest? Does that suggest that they they like lift their hands up against them to attack them? Oh, what you're saying on condemn? I know one another definition of condemn is disapproval. Kind of like, we know better. We know better when we make a mistake. We And even our family and friends, if we make a mistake, they know we made a mistake. <coughs> and I know it's important for us not to declare, have that wrong judgment, and not, but to help them through our mistakes, to help us realize and get that support we need. And sometimes condemn can also just mean that disapproval, that disappointment as we make a mistake. But like we were saying earlier, we're given the opportunity to overcome and our family and friends and all those around us shouldn't be there to discourage us or to tell us how we did wrong when we know we did, but to be there to uplift us and to help us through it. See, I've just looked up the word condemn. Uh, there's three definitions. Express complete disapproval of cens censure, sentence someone to a pact practical punishment, especially death, officially declares something to be unfit for use. Now, um, when Jesus says, uh, talks about you shall not, uh, condemn not, and it yes shall not be condemned, he's specifically wanting us not to stand in condemnation of other people's uh, sins. Like, uh, for example, uh, 
like if if a woman came to me and said that she committed adultery I would give her what Jesus says in John chapter 8 and where Jesus says go sin uh, no more you know I won't stand there and, and, and do what the religious Pharisees did over 2,000 years ago wanting to stone the woman to death um, I won't bring that law against her what I'll do is I'll bring her Jesus because Jesus of the King James Bible, uh, he doesn't want us to walk in condemnation. Um, vengeance belongs to him, him only. And um, like we are not to, um, to condemn anyone um, of their uh, sins. And that's something that I've, I've sort of, well, I've actually learnt as I read the King James Bible. But when I was looking at Doctrines and Covenants section 42 verse 81, I went, wait a minute, something's not right here. This doesn't add up. Condemned it in a mouth of two witnesses. So this means that Mormons, two Mormons has the rights, well they don't, uh, but according to the Mormon faith, they they have the rights to condemn it, he or she that's caught in adultery. So you know what they're doing? They're going and they're they're actually going by the the law where if a woman is caught in adultery, she is to be stoned to death. She was condemned to be put to death. So uh, that's what I, it, it confuses people. Doctrines and Covenants section 42 verse 81, it brings confusion because if you trust that you cannot condemn anyone according to what Jesus says in, uh, uh, in the Gospels, uh, in the King James Bible, in uh, Luke's Gospel, uh, then you won't want to try and condemn anyone, right? We don't want to condemn someone. We don't want to make someone feel bad. That's, yeah, that's that's right. Like, so you won't agree with Doctrines and Covenants section 42 verse 81 then? What I agree with Doctrine and Covenants is that it tells us the importance to not commit adultery. <coughs> uh, that is different. But, that people but, make that we do make a mistake. And when we do make those mistakes, we do feel like it's brutal. We do feel like discouragement. That combination. Yeah, but you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't come, you others, can't. But to me, from ourselves. Like, we can condemn ourselves. We can have no. else in that case. No. No. What does Jesus mean when he says condemn not? When I hear that, I hear not to be discouraged, not to beat ourselves up. Not That's right, to not to condemn ourselves. To ourselves. So we can't condemn ourselves because uh, the thing is, is, is um, Jesus wants us to feel peace in John chapter 16, verse 30. You are exactly right. Jesus does want us. He wants us to have that peace and that joy because that's why we're here on the earth. We are here on the earth to have joy. So to learn and to grow and to draw closer to our Savior and to our Heavenly Father. So if you don't condemn yourself then you are wanting to encourage yourself, right? I'm sorry, can you say that again? If, if you don't condemn yourself, then that's a good thing, right? Um, well, I think it's important not to beat yourself up, yeah? yeah? Because we're all children of God. We all make mistakes. But I think it's important for not to focus on our mistakes, but to think about our improvement and how we can become better. I mean, we are to, to judge our sins um, and, and confess them before Almighty Jehovah God in Christ Jesus and to be forgiven, ask for forgiveness. Uh, there's a difference between judgment and condemnation. Um, but in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he doesn't want us to, to condemn ourselves just because we're, we are committed sin. Now I'm going to take you to a beautiful verse, great verse that helped me to overcome um, many, uh, well, this 
I thought I committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, but when I read this scripture, I knew straight out I did not commit the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. In John chapter 5 verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and it believeth on him that sent me, hatheth everlasting life, and it shall not come into condemnation, but is pasted from death unto life. Now, because I believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I knew that I cannot come into that eternal condemnation. Yeah, we, we're not going to suffer forever. God provided us a way, and he, they promised us. It's called the plan of salvation, to where we can always be happy, that we will be put into, that when we go into heaven, that we'll be in a kingdom of glory, where we will be happiest. And so in um, Doctrines and Covenants, section 42, verse 18, it rules out that murderers, uh, like he that kills shall have no forgiveness, shall not have forgiveness. It says, And now, behold, I speak unto thy church, thou shalt not kill. And he that kills shall not have forgiveness in this world, nor in the world to come. So um, that is just that is tr is um, contradicting Third Nephi thirty verse two. So how do you go about that one? Um, there is no forgiveness for people who kill. So, I mean, I can't serve a God who says that there's no forgiveness for he that kills. I mean, Moses killed in the King James Bible, but he did not die straight away. In uh, Doctrines and Covenants section 42 verse 19 claims, And again I say, Thou, sh thou shalt not kill, but he that killeth shall die. How come Moses... Uh, the prophet King David, the, the excellent prophets, never died when they killed someone. I know the stories you're talking about and how uh, God, he doesn't want us to kill. And we do see instances in the Bible where people kill each other. But we know that before those instances, they, they prayed. They were praying and they didn't want to do it at first, but God commanded them to do so. And we know that they did do things that, that was righteous and that is what God wants because we do see the blessings that came from it. But Heavenly Father does not want us to do that. That is not something we are commanded to do here. He wants us to live in peace and not only to live us in peace, but to help others live in peace. Uh, what was your name again? We're the sister missionaries and um, we emailed you a couple of weeks Yes, oh, yes, speaker. yes. But the thing is, is, um, is, would you ever tell someone that, and again I say, thou shalt not kill, but he that killeth shall die. Would you ever tell someone that he that killeth shall die? I, I don't know if I would tell someone that he that killeth shall die. But it's not uplifting. We're only here to uplift. So that, so, and so doctrines. The commandments that God gives us. And so, we know that the commandments that God gives us are for a reason. They're here to help us and to guide us, to keep us on the straight and narrow. And if we ever have questions or we're unsure about things, we can pray about it. We can get answers. Uh, with doctrines and covenants section 42 verse 19, that's speaking about today's um, generation. Uh, but how come there are some murderers that go to jail and they do not die straight away? How come the the justice system don't deliver them up to be hung? The justice of the Lord Jesus Christ is not can you say your question again? Uh, how come the justice system like the US um, justice system or Australian justice system, how come when someone murders someone they don't straight away give them to the authorities to execute them, kill them, murder them, get rid of them straight away? Well, I, I know that that's just not part of the gospel. Um, we don't, our the church does not give out views of how they feel for certain things because our church cannot decide 
for us. We have our agency to choose and what we believe in all the laws and the rules and the laws of the land. Just everything that the country is doing, the church does not give specific views because we aren't here to choose sides. We're not here to cause problems or any of that. And so we have our agency. Our agency is to help us make the choices. And if we make the good choices, agency is free. But when we do make those wrong choices, the agency does kind of control us and drag us down. Say that again. How agency, agency can be good and bad. And when we do make those good decisions, it's free for us. It gives us that more freedom to learn and to grow. Um, In um, Doctrines and Covenants section 1 verse 31, it talks about how um, how uh, the Mormon Lord cannot look upon sin. Now, um, I've already, uh, I think I may have discussed this one with you, um, but ha- like you know, um, you can see someone who tells a lie, right? So you can see their sin, but the thing is, is you do uh, much of a more of a good job than the Mormon Lord. Why? Because he can't look at someone who lies, but you can. So you'll be able to to tell that person they can repent. Now, if someone cannot look upon sin, they cannot tell you to repent. Think about that for just just a second. If, If you can't look upon sin... You can't tell that person to repent. Now, in order to tell a person to repent of sin, you need to look at their sin, right? So, the Doctrine and Covenants, the beauty of it, is modern-day revelation. When the, these revelations were given through Joseph Smith and the other leaders of the church back in the 1820s, 1830s. And so we know that times do change, and we have all of these tools to help us learn and to grow. And that these passages of scripture are given to us to help us continue to learn and grow and to get answers to our questions. And sometimes we don't get the answers to our questions because it's not the time and place for us to know these answers. And that there will be a time where we will have that perfect knowledge and that our questions will be answered. And I promise you that as you pray and you read, that you will receive your answers, if not now, but later. Because sometimes our blessings and our answers, they come fast, they take a while, or, or we won't get them until heaven. Now, so, uh, my question is, is um, do you think that the death penalty in the United States, do you think that's good or bad? As missionaries, we don't give our opinions of those things. Why? We are called to. Why? Because it's not part of our calling. Our calling as missionaries is to invite others to come unto Christ. But and yet, with the woman who is caught in adultery, Jesus Christ that is atonement to repent, to be baptized, and to have the holy gift of the gift of the Holy Ghost, and for them to endure to the end. Our purpose is to invite and to help those. So and the, giving our views on. Um, the elections, on the death penalty, anything that's going on in the world does not relate to helping someone increase their faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's what we are here to do, is to promote faith in Jesus Christ and to help people make that commitment of baptism in his name. So just in general, with the woman who was caught in adultery, she was being nearly stoned to death. Uh, you, do you think that the religious Pharisees um, were wrong trying to stone that woman to death? I know that they were following an older commandment, but we had Jesus Christ to be there, to be that teacher and that example. And we know that Christ was persecuted many times, and that people tried to trick him and to make fun of him and to show that he was wrong. And we know that Christ, he was that perfect example, that he loved everyone, and he was that perfect teacher. And because of those stories and those instances, we have these lessons for today, to apply to us personally and to follow Christ's example. Now, so, in Exodus, if the judges didn't bring the woman, we wouldn't have had the story of Christ. We wouldn't have had this example. We wouldn't be able to have 
this opportunity to know that we can repent and that we can be forgiven and that our Savior will always forgive us. So if those things didn't happen, we wouldn't have had this lesson today and we wouldn't be able to apply it in our life today. Now, with Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, it says, Thou shalt not kill. So in one, in one aspect, I could say I do not agree with the death penalty in the United States of America because of my Christian faith of Exodus, 30, uh, Exodus 20 verse 13 that says, Thou shalt not kill. Hallelujah. I mean, I could draw someone to Christ, a murderer who's on death row, and, and, and lead them, convert them to Christ, and that the saving grace of God saves them through Christ Jesus, and they can be saved. Dude. But if someone who, uh, who cannot make an opinion on the death penalty, they, they can't uh, influence murderers who are on death row to be able to draw nearer to Christ because you need uh, the truth. And now Exodus 20 verse 13 is truth. Now, there are many false teachers out there that try and say, well, uh, the scripture really says thou shalt not murder, but uh, it says thou shalt not kill. Uh, killing uh, is wrong, and as a result of murder is is a result of killing someone. So um, <clears throat> so just have a think about what I say because you you can you draw someone to Christ who is on death row by telling them Exodus twenty verse thirteen. Yeah, I I definitely think you've been reading the scriptures and you're searching. I've been reading it since uh, I was. Uh, I've been uh, a true born again Christian believer since I was 19, and I'm nearly 31 years old. So I've got lots of experience about how to apply the King James Bible, and um, yeah. and basically um, with with um, like how like um, with uh, telling someone telling someone about the love of God, you want them to know and fear God. Now, something to think about, and it's it's a it's a favorite one of my absolute excellent scriptures that I really really love to read, and it's it's what the Holy Spirit is wanting me to tell you, uh, Jeremiah. Chapter thirty-two, verse forty. Now, have now before I tell you that scripture, do you have the fear of the Lord in your heart, like the fear of God? Where is that in Jeremiah? Jeremiah thirty-two, verse forty. Thirty-two, verse forty. All right. Okay. Um, I have, so I have it as, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, that they shall not depart from me. Now, that means that uh, Christian believers, true born again Christian believers, who have the fear of God in their hearts, cannot depart from God, right? Um, the way I read it, and the way I understand the fear, feel about it is that we can have um, that not necessarily we fear of God that he won't do anything of us because God he loves us he's powerful and he's merciful but there's actually let me pull it up real quick there's a quote that I like that talks about godly fear and I think it's really helped brought me peace and give me an answer and kind of questions like that and I know Heavenly Father he is our loving Heavenly Father and he's only here to help us. But God we fear is loving and trusting in him. Because we need, cause we ha he has that perfect love for us. And that faith in the Lord can have, give us power to hush those fears. But we need to have godly fear. Because godly fear is a source of peace, assurance, and confidence. And, do and you... these are teachings that are given to us by an apostle named Bednar. And these teachings show us that 
not that theory in God of because of things he does, because God is powerful. But as we fear God and turn to him and ask for him and seek that guidance, he can help us bring peace in our lives. He can assure us of the decisions we are making that are right and that he can give us the confidence we need to continue to do the things he asks. And so in uh, Jeremiah 32 verse 40 says, And I will make an everlasting an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, that they shall not depart from me. So that's God making an eternal promise which he can't break, he can't lie. He's saying once his fears in their hearts... They cannot depart from him. So whose hearts are mentioned in Jeremiah 32 verse 40? And 32 verse 40. Well, when I see that he is making an everlasting everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good. He's saying right there, and he made a promise to us all that God will not turn away from us, that he loves us, and that he's going to help us make the right decision. And by following him and turning to him, that is good. And he has that fear for us because he loves us. To help us to lead us and to direct us in the right way because at one point we all feared our family members i remember fearing my parents when i did something wrong but i knew they loved them even though they were upset with me for my mistakes and that's how god is god is a loving heavenly parent just how our parents were there for us and friends for us we have to fear. So, more or less basically if you have children you would never cast them away right I'm sorry, say the question again? If you had children, you would not, um, like, turn your back on them. You would not forsake them, right? Yeah, if we have our families, we shouldn't turn against our families. We shouldn't discourage our families. They're there to help them. We have that commitment to our family members. We have that commitment to God. To lift and to help, to lead and to guide. And so, um, Hebrews 11, uh, in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Hebrews uh, 13, verse 5, I'll grab that scripture. This is a powerful scripture. And God, Jehovah, is saying, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that means that we can't, you, we can't walk away from God. Once I surrendered to God, I surrendered my whole will so that he could use me and never forsake me, right? God. We should turn to God and listen to Him and do the things He asks. And we should have that full trust in God, like the scriptures say, to turn to Him and to have all of our faith and trust in Him. And so and that. You no, know, we're really sorry. Actually, we have a curfew and we have to be getting going. But uh, we love these questions. We love that you're searching. And we really appreciate that you have that dedication. And we ask that you continue to read the Book of Mormon and to pray. And we will get those that contact information we were talking about earlier in this call to help you. So you can have missionaries come visit you in person and do those studies with you in person with the scriptures. Um, I will uh, get that information from you. Um, and um, just have a think about um, Jeremiah 32 verse 40. Hebrews 13 verse 5 and also have a think about this one question if you can't look upon sin you won't be able to judge it ask anyone to forgive like ask them to repent of that sin but just think about it you can look at their sin and tell them to repent uh, and so by that logic that logic don't agree with doctrines and covenants uh, section 1 verse 31 so just have a think about those thoughts. Like yeah, what we I definitely will. All right, you have a good um good night. Yeah, you have a good day, Dale. Bye. Bye.